Greetings. My name is Dan Vetta, former chairperson of the Split This Rock board. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for our reading this evening. And to those watching its archived recording, I'm a queer Latinx Dejano borderlands born poet in his 50s with long hair and a full beard with my gray hair dyed fuchsia pink at the moment. I'm sitting in front of a window off camera. Uh, behind me is a brightly tie-dyed tapestry in flame colored shades of red, yellow, and gold made by a dear friend. I am hosting from my home in Washington, DC. I hope you enjoy this evening's program. Welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first reader for this evening, Justice Amir. Hi, uh, we saw that there were some technical difficulties. So I think Rash is actually gonna uh, provide their statement again first. Um, and, but thank you so much, Dan. And I'm so happy to be here with you all and with all the poets. Um, but I'm gonna pass it back to Rasha, uh, who prepared a wonderful statement from Swift This Rock. Hello, my name is Rasha Abdul Hadi. I'm currently serving as executive director at Split This Rock. I'm wearing a black button down shirt with iridescent rhinestone bow tie, large tortoiseshell eyeglasses and metallic purple lipstick. I am wearing a black and rainbow kufiya around my shoulders. I have lighter skin and brown eyes and my hair is black, curly, chin length and shaved on the sides. Behind me is a shelf of books on poetry, transformative justice and indigenous and black feminisms. I'd like to offer a land, labor and social movement acknowledgement. We would usually offer a land and labor acknowledgement here at the beginning. It is important to remember that we are broadcasting from the unceded home of the Piscataway and near the homes of Powhatan, Pamunkey, Chickahominy, Monacan, and other Native nations. It is important to remember that this whole nation is made from looted land and constructed from looted labor. It is important to remember that Black folks built this imperial capital and that Black people across the country and the world, day and night, are still leading struggles for liberation. Split This Rock was founded in fellowship halls and in the streets, and we continue giving attention and solidarity to the streets, to Black organizers in D.C. and beyond, to the families and communities who are grieving Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and every Black life taken by a long history of state-sanctioned violence to lawyers and medics, and to those who are sheltering protesters and bailing people out of jail. From Minneapolis, Tallahassee, Columbus, Jackson, Los Angeles, New York, Denver, Houston, in major cities and small towns in every state, and to you, wherever you are. At Split This Rock, we remember that this whole nation is made from stolen indigenous land and with stolen black labor. We pay attention to the recent looting of COVID-19 emergency funds, a looting that represents one of the greatest transfers of wealth in U.S. history and is set to deepen racial inequality for generations. This is the history of looting we remember. We know that many communities are joining in struggle now. We want to remember that the white supremacist violence visited on so many of our communities goes back to before the founding of the settler colonial nation and that this nation has been anti-Black and anti-Indigenous from before its beginning. We must remember that these root causes to under, we must remember these root causes to understand the origins of violence against so many of our communities, the escalation of verbal and physical violence visited on Asian American communities during the spread of COVID-19, the cruel disregard for the lives of disabled and chronically ill people during a global pandemic, the genocidal violence against Latinx communities, the continued surveillance and policing of people racialized as Muslim under the Patriot Act and the War on Terror, the continued criminalization of all non-white immigrants, legislative and physical violence against women, cis, trans, and non-binary, the criminal disregard for the ecosystems that sustain us all and on and on across the front lines of resistance being held by so many receiving these words. We must remember anti-Blackness and anti-Indigenous violence as root causes 
in order to protect and nurture each other's liberation. Fannie Lou Hamer, who founded the Freedom Democratic Party in Mississippi when she was excluded from the Democratic Party apparatus there, taught us that nobody is free until everybody is free. Our liberation depends on each other. Thank you for gathering with us to remember and practice that tonight. Thank you, Rasha. Um, and uh, apologies for uh, for my getting the order wrong. Um, for, uh, first up is Kyle Dargan. Uh, Kyle Dargan is the author of five collections of poetry, most recently Anagnorensis, uh, Triquarterly Northwestern uh, 2018, which was awarded the 2019 Lenora Marshall Poetry Prize and long listed for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. For his work, he's received the Kavi Khan and Poetry Prize, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and grants from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. His books have also been finalists for the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award and the Eric Hoffer Awards Grand Prize. Dargan has partnered with the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities to produce poetry program at the White House, uh, not the current White House, uh, and the Library of Congress. He's worked with and supports a number of youth writing organizations such as 826 DC, Writopia Lab, Young Writers Workshop, and the Dodge Poetry High Schools program. He is currently an associate professor of literature and assistant director of creative writing at American University. Uh, you can visit Kyle's website at AmericanBoy.com. That's American-BOI.com. Please join me in welcoming Kyle Dargan. Thanks, Dan. I went and got comfortable because I thought we uh, changed the order. My name is Kyle Dargan. I'm a cis man. I have uh, brown skin. Uh, a half row, which is, I guess you would say, short curly hair. Um, I have on a gray shirt, and I am standing in my kitchen in Washington, D.C., because uh, I think the kitchen is the most important room in the home. Uh, I'd like to thank Split This Rock uh, and all the other readers uh, for their work um, on and off the page, on and off the stage, on and off the screen. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank the local organizers here in DC, BLM DC, uh, Black Youth Project 100 here at DC, Empower DC, um, not only for putting forward uh, the radical agenda, but also um, resisting the empty symbolism that we've seen uh, acted out here uh, in front of the White House. And as poets and writers, I think we understand the importance of uh, symbolism and its power and that we do need to push back against uh, that powerful symbolism sometimes in our own ways. So I like to thank them. Um, this first poem I'm gonna read uh, is titled Opening. Opening. The home is a quite snug coffin. Inside I scroll down and volume up through the trilling of what isn't currently wearing our insides thin, the news that eats us slowly. Not with gnawing as ghastly as the germs and who can confidently evade air. Aerosolized is a new alpha predator of nightmare words. Its predation leaves my mind's gray fields untrod for what now feels like seasons, the carcasses of immediate hopes having been dragged into the underbrush. There was a decade, maybe two, when the city seemed a good idea. Now we are dying in deep breaths because we live so many to a home, so poor per capita. Census data never saved the lowest of us from being imagined as indifferent to pain. So we are dissuaded from hospital beds to wither in or test to prove the things to which our sweats and knocking lungs testify. Replacement, an epidemiologist calls it, opening the window so that 
the air outside our walls displaces the air inside. Replacement, when the city inhales revenue and sneezes the dusty into the adjacent county. In the ailing speak of air hunger, the sensation of underfed lungs. It is spring, the air seems so abundant. What if my elders is intubated? I know she will not be breathing in a week. I tell my toddler in the playground, the daycare, the play place, all closed. Because of the virus, she learns to complete each sentence. There are now thin panes, windows between us and our living, between unsure and unsafe. Some days clear glass, one way mirror on other days when the neighborhood specific suffering seems unseeable. I have not cried. I want to when I walk down 8th Street or East Capitol thinking of all the businesses that just fought replacement only to have their store faces covered, only to find them asphyxiated like this. All commerce is not equal behind the glass. I do not know when I will write the phrase open air with any confidence that we know what it means or how we need it to flow within us. Um, this next poem is uh, addressing police violence uh, as a content warning and uh, it's titled Poem Resisting Arrest. Poem Resisting Arrest. This poem is guilty. It assumed it retained the right to ask its question after the page came up flush against its face. The purpose this poem serves is obvious, even to this poem, and that cannot stop the pen or the fist choking it. How the page tastes at times, unsalted powerlessness in this poem's mouth. A blend of that and what it has inhaled of the news. It spits blood, inking. It is its own doing and undoing. This poem is trying to hold itself together. It has the right to remain either bruised or silent, but it is a poem. So it hears you'd be safer if you stopped acting like a poem. Stop resisting. Where is the daylight this poem asks and is thus crushed between? existence and resistance between the now bloody page and the poem. Another poem will record the arrest of this poem, decide what to excerpt. That poem will fail. It won't find the right metaphor for the pain of having to lift epigraphs from the closing words of poems that were accused of resisting. That poem is numb. This poem is becoming numb, already losing feeling in its cupped phrasing. No one will remember the nothing of which this poem was accused, just that it was another poem that bled. This poem never expected to be this poem, yet it must be for you who will not acknowledge the question. This poem knew it was dangerous to ask why. after people stop asking about me. What everyone asks, how is it to raise a daughter within this hissy fit, christened Trump's America? My daughter's breach into life five months after that vote, that incision. She is 18 months old now, can count her own way to 16, knows maybe 30 animals, orange or any other color remains as of yet uncoded in her mind. She does not see any of this. Her world is chirping bye-bye to the bubbles in her bath before she sleeps. Yes, it is harder than you might think to teach a being concepts you can't recall learning yourself. Repetition is useful, as is multi-sensory reinforcement. So raising my daughter in this moment, that is what it feels like finding so many ways to repeat one concept until it implants and she commands a new pathway for commuting with the world. It is work, 
but it does not break me. In fact, I feel spared the now until we are engaged in something innocent, like a ride through Wheaton Regional Park, not rearing her, just cradling her legs in my lap. Those instances when I regain my selfish mind, its capacity to ponder how many years it might take to make an America in which my kiddo can count on having fewer rights than her grandmother enjoyed, or her great-grandmother, who lived a life of dodging dangerous men, even after she joined the police, kept the sidearm. But who wants that escaping my mouth? Instead, I just point towards the trees flanking the tiny tracks, beckoning. Who's that? Yes, baby, it's an owl. This next poem opens with an epigraph from James Baldwin uh, in which he was talking about whiteness. Uh, and that epigraph is, we can no longer afford that particular romance. The poem is titled Daily Conscription. Brother Ricky halts me before I cross East Capitol. He trumpets that we are at war. I want to admit that I do not believe in white in the manner that Baldwin did not. But Brother Ricky would simply retort that my disbelief is no identity from the imaginations of those who think themselves white. As we await the stoplight shift, so I may walk and he may holler, final call, between lanes of idle traffic. I think of race as something akin to climate change, a force we don't have to believe in for it to kill us. I once believed in the seasons. I fantasized fall as Brother Ricky's favorites when his suits, boxy and plaid, would be neither too hot nor thin. But we are losing spring and fall, tripping from blaze to frost and back. And what's to say we won't soon shed another season, one of these remaining two, and live on either an earth of molten streets or one of frozen light? That's when worlds end, no. When, after we've eradicated ourselves, we become faint fossils to be exhumed by the curiosities of whichever life forms follow our reign. I still owe Brother Ricky $2 for the paper he last placed in my hand, calling me soldier. I don't have to believe that I'm enlisted in order to understand he'll forgive my debt, so long as this idea of whiteness sorties above us, ultraviolet, obliging, and aseasonal unending deployment. Released by the stoplight signal, I advance, my head down, straining to discern the crossfire from the cover. Um, the erotic is a measure between after Lord. Your body is not my pommel horse, nor my Olympic pool or diving board. Your body is not my personal internet channel, nor my timeline, nor my warm Apollo spotlight. Your body is not my war gala. Your body is not my game, preseason or playoffs. Your body is not my political party convention. Your body is not my front line or my war's theater. Your body is not my time trial. Your body is not my entrance exam or test of patriotism. I am a citizen of this skin, that alone, and yours is not to be passed nor won. What is done when we let our bodies sharpen the graphite of each other's bodies is not my test, not my solo show. One day I'll learn. I'll prove I know how to lay with you without anticipating the sound, the scorecards of your eyes. How I might merely abide, we too, unseated, equidistant from the wings, in a beating black box, all stage. And this is my last poem. It's titled, Love Be a Slow Moving Storm. 
and thank you all for listening. Love be a slow moving storm. Love can cast your body across the city, burgeoning like Uno de Lis, your gaze trained to the west from whence you came, where you gathered, bared flesh and churn. Love, give not a damn about our commutes. Love, make from seconds sloshing cubic feet, transform intersections into stalling pits, conjure rivers from roads. None die from drowning. You are bred and born submerged. We stumble away from our mothers, forgetting how to aspirate any substance but air. Love, fill the lungs underneath the city. Flush our toxins into the bay. Then beckon back the bay, love, to take our sidewalks in a surge. Bathe we and we. You know, I am in no rush to be anything but this breathing conundrum, an inorganic anomaly known as personhood. But observe, love, the dust of me already rising as it seeks some heaven, hoping to atomize, flock, and perch on parched high ground. Scalp fleck and eyelash and lip chaff and exhaust, exhaust from heart and lungs, all wanting to become finch and egret and canary, hawk and loon. So love, suppress their lifting from me. Be there, no aviaries above you. Come slowly, draping range chain mail around my body. May nothing pierce or leave my skin. Keep my ghost subdued and, if it must be, drunk an evaporation risk. Love, we live between two seas, both current racked and hemmed at the offings. May you love, wind rip our world along those crease edges. Discard all this packaging, infrastructure wilted upon the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Trevino L. Brings Plenty is next. Trevino Brings Plenty's work has appeared in Yellow Medicine Review, Red Ink Magazine, World Literature Today, Plume, Prairie Schooner, North American Review, Waxwing, Poetry, and New Poets of Native Nations. He received his MFA in Poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He has two poetry collections, Wakba Wanaji, Ghost River, and Real Indian Junk Jewelry. Learn more at his website, trevinobringsplenty.com. Trevino. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. All right, coming up here, speaker view. I'm seeing it in my office, which is located in the basement. You can't see it on the screen. It's blackened out in the back. I'm wearing a tan shirt of brown skin, wearing headphones. This lighting might lighten my skin, so I'm probably more of a beige right now. And it's great to be here. Thank you for the invite and being part of this, this panel of poets here. Doing, doing the good work that we do. Um, a good thing I have on the side of my uh, desk is tissues. When you're always um, at poetry readings, there's some feelings that happen. And that's a great thing. And in our times right now, we need other feelings to be happening as well. This first poem is called Dismantle. There are a few Lakota words. Oh, before that, uh, my um, cishet 
pronouns, he, him, his. And then Mini Koji Lakoto, enrolled in the Shine River Sioux tribe. Uh, so this first poem dismantled. Uh, Suzecha Sapa, which is a uh, black snake, and that's more reference to the oil pipelines, um, that metaphor. Uh, Makpia, which translates to sky or things in the sky. And Washichu is uh, maybe settler, maybe white supremacy maybe colonizer, that thing that is not Lakota, different values. Dismantle, hand, eclipse, bone club, closed fist, thrashing sheetrock, Zusecha Sapa, again, dismantle song, Lake bed ignite, light cluster ripple, central cavity swept in, flurry throat fires, Machpia side wind, down skin scales, seep, grass, black from yellow, Spark iris, flutter pin, eyelids, rock, pressure, rock, face, flourish, brush, exhale, cinder block, smoke, redstone, silk buffed, mouthpiece, Washichu economy, snake through rib cage, back talking, unmoved tendons reverberate. Next poem is called Reddish, Brownish. Um, there are some content warning, colonization, I guess, violence, reddish, brownish, arms, face, scrotum, dark brown, the kind of brown to drive monsters to exterminate, bison to star of a people. Design policy with intentional marketing titles, assimilation, relocation, termination. Enough to talk about a vanishing race in front of you as theory and practice. Enough to throw stats out as a summation of cultural identity. Erasure thread of empire, its subjects uneasy, comfort, to express you wooden and to say it's just conversation or playing devil's advocate. Maybe they know closed fists and pockets, they change subject. I use shading the back of hands to gauge who is in the tutelage of systemic beauty, adorned beautiful, we darken each other ripe for violence. I carry lived stories, interface, beautitious facade, have seen anxiety coil, unravel, belly at day's end, curiosity curated social media feed, reinforced by sentient algorithm. It's barb threading through digits. I work through the other's language. I feel hypocritical. I dream English language. This next poem, um, I worked for a bit in a, a 
mental health treatment facility for at-risk youth. And so in, ever since that well, job experience, occupation, those the, the processing still happens. They, the scenes, uh, the vicarious trauma, the whole, the whole experience keeps popping back up in some of my work. Harvest. Song born children, system injected, they sing themselves red into bare room edges, brown limbs in subacute, pale green, gray walls, doors lock outside, thin blue mattress, commodity harvest, morning routine, face blooms wild. I'm trained to secure children safe, not by wrist might break, small hand thrashes, we lean into gravity, plant ground cheek. Into the milieu sucking saltine cracker, flush and safe until lights out, Plexiglass sing, grandmother hands. This next poem is called Synapse, Synapse Lightning. One song sang slithers bones and knuckles at meat mask, lick synapse lightning strikes, lateral undulation map helix flares through our hands. Gristle chewed waves blast through me. I reel back to unpack its shadow cast to its build. Dirt hooves, next poem. Hooves to dirt churn blade, hands canyoned, closed fists. Skin migrates over bone infrastructure, wraps brown neck bottle, iris circumference, wooden room floor, matte fur knuckle copper knob, thrust pain, micro explosion, sliver arm sleeve, micro explosion, thrust pain, copper knob, knuckle matte fur. Wooden room floor, circumference iris, brown neck bottle wraps, bone infrastructure, migrate skin, hands canyoned, hooves churn dirt blades. This poem's called Through the Field. Sunflowers yellow, the field slow, dust skyline bleed. My mother's small body struggles to kick over the truck ignition. She prostrates against bench seat, pressing down the clutch. Stalled in the road's shoulder, gas gone, we wait for refill. Clear pop bottles, pinwheel out the window. Gray smoke puff from rusted muffler, cloud thrust in rear view. Splintered side mirror, green bells burst from the hill. She punches the cracked dashboard, fueled truck roars alive. Mono, stereo creases the wind. My hand slices horizon gleam, highway stapled to the prairie. This poem's called Riverside. River surface glow, start over. River surface gold crusted by late afternoon. He races the shallow splash, steps on a turtle shell shard, ball of foot 
opens. Dusted blue truck chopping the air with Hank Williams. Crumpled wax paper tumbles across picnic blanket. Open and deflated sun heated orange pop cans. He screams into mother's arms. So this will be the last poem. Um, these poems I'm reading are from my work in progress manuscript, whatever it may look like, but a lot of it's been inspired by, you know, um, in, the, in the process of making this manuscript, having a, a child. So within having, well, my first child, an only child so far, um, start to reevaluate my own memories of childhood. So a lot of these poems are that. And so, yeah, and also in reflection to the jobs I have done as doing doing social work and working in the field. And so some of these are autobiographical mixed in with other stories from family and friends and what may have you. So the last poem is called Can Returns. Saturday, we are forced out of the apartment Explore roads for cans. We haul a shopping cart. Hunger festers. Fire ants swarm. Not until we cash out can we eat barbecue chips, pop, white bread, bologna slices. We nap near the vacant baseball diamond in the park. Watch clouds drift in small haze. Thank you, everyone, for having me here today. And that's it. Thank you, Trevino. A poet and critic, Cameron Awkward Rich is the author of Sympathetic Little Monster, Ricochet Editions 2016 and Dispatch, Persia Books 2019, winner of the 2018 Lexi Rudnitsky's Editor's Choice Award. His poetry has appeared in Narrative, The Baffler, Indiana Review, Verse Daily, The Offing, and elsewhere. And he has received fellowships from Cave Canem and The Watering Hole. Cam holds a PhD in Modern Thought and literature from Stanford University and is assistant professor in women, gender, sexuality studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Please visit his website at seaawkwardrich.com. Cameron Awkward Rich, welcome. Hello, um, I am Cam Awkward Rich, I am a black transmasculine 30 year old person. Um, I have short black hair, glasses, I'm wearing a black t-shirt and I am currently in the sort of very messy office that I share with my partner because it is the room with the window that gets the best light and I am very vain. Um, yeah, so I, I find bantering over Zoom to be impossible. So I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum. Um, I'll just say that many of the poems here uh, are written kind of inevitably in the shadow of the kind of mediation of Black death. Um, so that's like a thing that is in a lot of these poems. If there's something specific, I will try to mention it in advance. Um, this first poem is called, All My Friends Are Sad and Bright. I think door, and there is, open, and here's a room where everything you've lost is washed ashore. We've seen the news, we know the story, how even our bodies hurt us sometimes so much. Room of broken mirrors, room of salt, room of marigolds, and it's your party, baby. Here's a crown, here's a gown, and no man just around the corner, all your eyes on you. I think gunflower, and here's a field. 
Here's a room where every bullet planted blooms, boy with flower, boy with metal rose. What's done is done. What fire affords you? I was a child once. Anything could be my kingdom. All I had to do was say. Here's a room of water and gold and nothing else. A room in which a man takes back his blood. Goodbye, blood. Goodbye, stars. Goodbye, dead light troubling the dance your body does all by itself. I was by myself once, beside myself. Breath fogging up a window and what's on the other side. Only everything you wanted. And here's a room of everything you wanted. Think peppermint and myrrh. Think loved and you don't even have to die. Um, the second poem uh, is a poem that is sort of written as a direct address to um, a person whose sort of story I came across in the process of doing research for a kind of different, more academic project. Um, it was a sort of brief mention in newspapers in Chicago in, in around the 18, in like beginning of the 1880s of um, a Black person who had been rest, arrested in Chicago wearing a dress. I um, mean, it was this whole sort of long uh, story about them, but um, it was a story that I could never find all of the pieces to. Um, and so I kind of gave up on making it a research project and I instead wrote this poem. Um, so the poem is called Still Life and it's directed to Lawrence Jackson, arrested in Chicago wearing a dress, 1881. A figure in the frame, black dress slit up the thigh, a voice issues from the seam. I sit in the dark and watch your hips, your practiced walk. Somewhere there is a photograph of me in strapless dress, me flexing my grin, my skinny arms. An image won't show you the fight at its edges. My girlfriend shining like a pearl, her father's finger on the shutter, the compromise beneath the skirt. If I can see you only in this moment you are caught, what kind of we does that make? Rows of dark bodies hunched against the page, above the page. In the archive of ink and yellow trees, there you are before the judge, offering to leave the city, to walk away with nothing in your pockets, no pockets. This, you think, is what they want from you, to look and not see you standing. What happens after that? The trail ends with you framed by dark. They don't want us to leave exactly. Instead, to not have to look to know we're there. Anything can be made into a cage. Garment, sentence, cage. I draw a frame around the frame. A bright afternoon in Indiana on your shoulders. Dress black and spun in a field of gold. Dress a knot of brazen black birds. The body, not a question. Um, so those first two poems were from my most recent collection, Dispatch, which came out in December. Um, but uh, the, these next handful are all poems that I've written since March, so sort of since the shelter in place orders. So that's maybe something to have in the background. Um, yeah, uh, this first one, maybe I'll give a content warning for something like suicidality, although it's very small. My life closed twice. Liz, I think her name was, the woman my mother brought me to. We played cards in her perfumed office, lavender, tulips, bowl of wax fruit. I was 10 and wanted to die. I don't know why I'm here again. I lived, obviously I lived. When I was older, but still a child, not innocent, but foolish, I looked up from my solitary suffering. I learned the history of men. I pointed to a spot on the map they rendered. I said, then, then, built my ordinary life in a room at the end. If it's true what they say, that poetry is written with the knowledge of and against death, that it is a beacon, a bulwark, then love, I confess, I have been no poet. Outside, a hawk circles overhead. Four cops circle a woman dressed all in red. I circle the apartment as you sleep happily in the next room. Just this once, I want so desperately to be proven wrong. The thing you should know about this next poem is that um, it is addressed to my fifth grade teacher who was, um, I think perhaps the first gay man I ever met knowing that he was a gay man and who obviously had um, 
lived uh, and been touched by the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and yeah, it's directed, directed to him. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And yet, even so, here we are at the precipice of the new century, century of wildfire, century of war and perfect technology of war, where I live a happy life, where my love bakes bread in the morning, where the sunlight dances in her hair and my friends, my friends, but it's the edge of the century, remember? And you, sir, are my fifth grade teacher, a man not like any man I've met. I imagine, though can't know, you alone weeding the garden of your mind, little rosebush, daffodil, dogwood tree run amuck in the yard, great cat, green eyes, crypt in the center where lay your dead and beautiful friends, your friends who are so far from the life you have now, where you are, remember, surrounded by children whom the news of the new president does not touch. Not yet, not at least in the labyrinth where they are the thing at the center, one weeping eye, matted fur. Sir, it's worse than you imagined. The birds outside are singing. And I understand it now, where you went that day, when you laid down forever on the floor of the classroom like you were dead, though you weren't dead, as we, the children, flew like so many terrible jeweled birds, head first into the window of the rest of our lives. Um, and this poem has the same title um, and is sort of about Ahmaud Arbery, but also sort of not. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And when I surfaced from the latest weather, torrent of bad wind shuttering the blinds so that I or something like me was lost and wandering again, the stale room where I fear fear was born, though how it is impossible to say. When I surfaced, you were talking about children. A man, barely not a child, was dead. Murdered, though it was months already between the scene and that name for it. The only way I know to outlast history is running. So that's what I do. I run. Even though even this action is a pantomime through which history, we all know it, speaks. A man particular is dead. And in the general body, the particular now, I am careful to keep my distance from the woman who was careful to smile at me in turn. When my father did not die, I didn't know, nothing happened. And when he told me years later, when the scene found its name, I found something so like certainty it must have been. You don't have to, is what I heard him say to me, live, you don't have to. Love, forgive me, for I believed it, believe. America is more and less itself than ever. Some days I run until my feet go mum, numb. Some days I am the darkest thing I'll see. Okay. I'm going back to poems from the book now. Um, this poem is also a running poem. Uh, and it relies on the joke that my mother is the kind of woman who runs marathons and believe that that is a perfectly regular thing to do. It's called The Cure for What Ails You. The cure for what ails you is a good run, at least according to my mother, which has seemed all my life like cruelty. When I had a fever, for example, or a heart shipwrecked and taking on the flood. But now, of course, this is what I tell my friend whose eye has been twitching since last Tuesday. What I tell my student who can't seem to focus her arguments, who believes still that it's possible to save the world in 10 to 12 pages double spaced. And without irony, I'm asking, have you tried going for a run? You know, to clear your head, this mother voice drowning out what I once thought to be my own. I'll admit that when that man became the president, before terrified, I felt relief. Finally, here was the bald face of the country and now everyone had to look at it. Everyone had to see what my loves for their lives could not unsee. Cruelty, after all, is made of distance. Sign here and the world ends somewhere else. The world, the literal world. I hold my face close to the blue light of the screen until my head aches, until I'm sick. And like a child, I just want someone to touch me with cool hands and say, yes, you're right, something is wrong. Stay here in bed until the pain stops and oh, mother. Remember the night when, 
Convinced you were dying, you raced to the hospital, clutching your heart. And by the time you arrived, you were fine. You were sharp as a blade. Five miles in and I can't stop thinking about that video. There's a man with his arms raised in surrender. He was driving his car, his own car, and they're charging him, bellowing like bulls. I didn't shoot you, motherfucker. You should feel lucky for that. Yes. Okay. Fine. My body, too, can be drawn like any weapon. Um, and this will be my last poem. Uh, it is also the last poem in the book. Um, and it is a cento, which means that it is composed entirely of lines that I have borrowed or stolen, dependent on how you look at it from um, other people. And in this case, um, all of these lines come from poets who either are my friends or the friends of my mind. Um, yeah, it's called Cento Between the Ending and the End. Sometimes you don't die when you're supposed to. And now I have a choice. Repair a world or build a new one. Inside my body, a white door opens into a place queerly brimming gold light. So velvet gold, it is like the world hasn't happened. When I call out, all my friends are there. Everyone we love is still alive, gathered at the lakeside like constellations. My honeyed kin, honeyed light beneath the sky, a garden, blue stalks, white buds, the moon's marble glow, the fire distant and flickering, the body whole, bright winged, brimming with the hours of the day, beautiful, nameless planet. Oh, friends, my friends, bloom how you must, wild until we are free. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to share this virtual stage with all of these poets. Thank you, Cameron. Justice Samir is a poet and organizer based in Providence, Rhode Island. Zero Work explores the experience of being a black trans woman in a post-racial and potentially post-apocalyptic America. Z is a Pink Door Fellow, Fem Slam Champion, a two-time Providence Grand Slam Champion. Justice was the Grand Marshal of the 2019 Rhode Island Pride Fest. Z is also a co-writer and producer of the theatrical production Anthem. Zier work has been published in Glass Poetry Press, Poetry Magazine, The Nation, and The Breakbeat Poets, Volume 2, Black Girl Magic Anthology. Find Justice online at justiceamirpoetry.com. Justice Amir. Thank you all so much for having me. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, hi, I am Justice Amir. I am a Black trans woman with light brown skin and an Afro puff updo sort of thing. I have on red lipstick, golden green earrings, and a denim button-up dress. Um, behind me, uh, there is a plant, a rainbow pride flag, a textile by indigenous makers in Oaxaca, Mexico, and a sign that states abolish the police. Um, throughout my performance, I'll be speaking about blackness, um, gender, uh, police violence, particular to the moment. Um, and this first piece, particularly deals with anti-Black police violence, um, as well as guns. And the cop says, and the cop says, the Black person had a gun. And of course they did. Don't you see their skin? That gun metal? It's easy to mistake a Black hand for a barrel, a cry for help as a gunshot. Who can expect a Black person to be unarmed as long as they're alive, right? It is a myth that black bodies are immune to bullets. The white people continue to try to prove this fact. Enough of us have died that I know it in urban legend, even if we aren't only murdered in urban areas. And the cop says the black person had a gun. And of course I do. Don't you see my skin? This gun metal? Black people are always packing. We always got something, a book or CDs or Skittles or a cigarette and rarely a toy gun or a legal one. But who cares? And black hands, those are all arms and dangerous. 
I'm starting to believe the critics. Guns don't kill people. Cops kill people. Not always with guns, but a few dozen rounds sure makes it easier. I'm sure it is a myth that black bodies attract bullets or they wouldn't have to fire so many. And the cop says, the black person had a gun. And of course I do. Don't you see it? I have it on me 24 seven. Some people call it a voice or pride or existence, but the cop sees it for what it is, a weapon, a threat, a thing that ends in death. If a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun and I am the gun, which one is the cop? Which one didn't make it to the end of the metaphor? This next piece uh, is offered in the voice of Katara from Avatar The Last Airbender. For context, uh, the first uh, it, it deals with the first six episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender, which I highly recommend for folks, um, and is uh, Katara trying to um, motivate a group of uh, captured folks, uh, folks who are, are captured by um, an enemy ship uh, to fight. Um, and it comes after um, the airbender, uh, they visited an airbending temple where these monks um, that the main character, um, including Gyatso, who we mentioned, the main character's mentor, um, were murdered in a genocide. And so um, this was also about the current moment um, and sort of a plea from a young organizer to uh, my elders um, for intergenerational uh, movement and solidarity. It is titled Imprisoned or A Letter from a Brown Girl's Witness to Earth Being Shackled. There's a look you just can't shake when you know the world has changed and context caves in around you. A mother's tear duct full, a quiet where the disappeared boy once stood, a shattering of water across the dirt. There is no fairness in war only undoing, unleashed breaths and unclenched fury. And I too will return to this home soil. Succumbing to despair is too easy a way to die. I've seen the way secrets move mountains. Don't mistake these cuffs for confinement. This is a new world, never been held by this much metal before. I see men surround me their faces so low to the ground, their fists so open. How is a simple child meant to make them move if their own kin won't kindle the flame in them? There is heart in survival, but it is cold and crumbling as stone under the pickaxe. Please do not kill my hope because you have lost yours. In one week I have seen miracles, women who cut the air, kings who keep their friendships, I watched a child become a destiny before my eyes. I even visited his, visited his bones. They too will become earth, but not before they are remembered. Oh, elders, how you've learned me freedom yet forsaken your own. Lived so long in this war, you forgot you were fighting. Found peace in a peace that's only fiction. And all my childhood torn from me the day I saw your submitted eyes. You've seen more and I have already seen so much. How could you not find the worth in using every weapon in your reach? I gave the ground back to you. I saw a graveyard of armor laid out before a monk's patience. But carnage must have consumed the mountain to burn the peace out of the people. How many friends fell before the winds were commanded to strike down the flames? How much violence did it take for Gyatsu to finally say enough? Was it worth his broken vow? I have a heart that tells me I will not lose. Family I have lost and family that will never be taken. I have water at my side and now earth beneath my feet. So won't you join me? This is but a battle. The war is still long, but my people even if you are not my people yet, let us break the ship that seeks to shackle us. This next piece uh, was actually um, 
the combination of three poems that were all actually written at very different times. Um, and uh, it's about the experience of being gender fluid. It does deal with dysphoria um, as well as sexuality and sex. Um, but in being gender fluid, meaning, you know, some days I am a woman, some days I am a mystery and every day I'm both. Uh, and uh, there is a, a, a challenge in, in learning how to truly uh, recognize yourself sometimes in the context of how other people are perceiving you and, 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 and holding you. Uh, this piece is called Liquid Triptych. One. Liking me, it's easy. Involves the capacity to fit yourself into the crevices of a vase. Holding a fluid thing only takes a container. You, be the cup. I'll be the wine, or the coffee, or the liquor spilled on the sheets. A bed could hold this fluid too. I don't flood. I won't make a wave unless given something to ripple against. Still, I've learned how to gouge out my pretty for eyes that want the right kind. Just tell me first. Are you the type to only drink after a meal? I can change shape for you, turn my curves into the thing you are thirsty for, paint my nails, clip them back, peel them off completely, fold my clothes back into whichever closet you need. I tell you, I am the body you need me to be. It always comes back to the container, not leaking. Fluid just seeps through every now and then. Just hold me in your arms, in your hands, and sit. I go down easy. It all comes back to the container. May be a flexible skin, but always solid. The paradox of holding a liquid gender. Aspiration is a sandbox against the ocean. Grains of want wash out and new desire wades in on the daily. Most of the shore stays the same broken shells. I put on a sunrise pink sweater. It drapes over my horizon flat chest. My partner asks what kind I want. The chest he needs. Touches mine weeks later and says, there's more now. My curves ask the mirror, where, how, when do they want to be? Questions of self-reflection, which muscle to build, which fat to gain to make a biology content. There are sunsets when I wish my arms looked more like a man's, thick, imposing, sure of themselves. There are mornings I wake wanting my hips to feel like a woman's, full, knowing, stable. I exist in contradiction, a trans body with a fluid dysphoria. The oldest trans woman I know ask why I haven't started hormones yet. I don't know how to explain this fear of flowing into an irreversible feminine without feeling like less of a woman. Younger trans girls pass me by, fostering their self-love with estrogen. I am so happy for them and so distant. I question the rippling of my hesitance, yearning for the same beauty. I don't know how to describe this dual dissatisfaction, the shell and its internal noise, an Atlantic's worth of wanting trying to reach two shores that are too far apart. The tides rise and fall, where is on the coast? The moon shimmers in the shallow. My eyes watch tiny hopes lift and land in the water. I'm afloat, sunbathing in the starlight. By the time the brightest one wakes, I'll have drifted back out to sea, wishing the waves would carry me to some imagined island that surfaces wherever my gender drifts. 
three. So I guess it goes. It rained so much today, on and off a steady constant. Like at times the clouds tried to choke us and then they just wanted a soft embrace. And so is sex, a palm on a throat before an arm wrapped against a back. These are all the ways I want you to hold me. Rough, gentle, storm, mist, pounding, the chime, the drip, and the aftermath. So you got here soaking wet. The street flooded, my senses obliged. Is this what April showers meant? When we meet, it pours. When it rains, we swim. This bed submerged, this room drowned in unforgiving precipitation. Thunder rolls until lightning strikes. I sink into you a beautiful wreck. We wake floating on the surface. Would be dry, but never made it to land. So this is what it's like to be a body and not just water to be held and not just contained, to be flowing and glorious, not just running. The rain is still coming down so hard. Tilt up my chin, open my mouth, know my thirst, quenched. Thank you all. And this next piece will be my last poem. Um, it is a newer piece. It deals with uh, blackness and white supremacy. Um, once again, I'm so honored. Thank you Split This Rock for having me. I am so grateful to be here with these incredible poets. And thank you to all of you for offering your gifts. Um, it was so beautiful to be here and to listen to this. Uh, when white supremacy kills me, When white supremacy kills me, don't let them scrub my rage from the internet. Demand I be both angry and righteous. When white supremacy kills me, remember my name and never let it come out of their mouths until there's no longer a delicacy for my people. When white supremacy kills me, use my proper pronouns. Make them choke on every syllable of their fragile language. Craft tongues so cultured they can never be stolen. When white supremacy kills me and they release my nudes, celebrate the angles, flood every site with your most, joy your most joyous picture and mine. Submerge them in a sea of black bodies alive, black smirks and black smiles. When white supremacy kills me, drown out the mugshot with every lip stained photo you can find. Drench the waves with Afro and fist and face painted for glory. Soak their spin and acid and remind them blood is a haunting promise. When white supremacy kills me, become a murder of crows. Sharpen your beaks and your feet. Unleash the war cries from your throats. Do not fret when they sound like mourning. Preen your sable beauty and pick this nation clean to its bones. When white supremacy kills me, command your black to scorch the earth. Singe every cage and every belt that keeps us bound. Melt the iron into homes for our elders. Claim every gem and return it to the earth. Remember fire is a life-giving gift even as it spreads. When white supremacy kills me, listen to my sisters like your life depends on it because they will be the only ones to save you. When white supremacy kills me, do not make me a martyr. Make me a history. Make me the last one. Make me the final name with all of your might live. When white supremacy kills me, live. Do not let them kill you or your hope or your fight, live. Do not let them shackle you or contain you or command you, live. Do not let them scare you or praise you or pity you, live free. Die loud if you must because this battle will cost lives but you will not let them take life from you any longer. When white supremacy kills me, promise you will not forsake joy after the revolution bell rings. I hope, to see, I hope to see a smile on your face as flames consume the capital. 
I hope to hear a song from your soul as the master's house comes crumbling down. I pray you all retire to a home cooked meal, a home cooked meal, grand as the truest family reunion this land has ever seen, with food divine as the hands is that cooked it, and children devouring their plates, and the men clean up without asking. Then every person will look to the love they have defended, and it will be good. When white supremacy kills me, and it will, show this world that grace and wrath are righteous sisters, that our people, Black people, are not wretched. We were simply waiting. Every scar from our suffering has led to our deliverance. A freedom so stunning, the world will stop to honor our beauty. Thank you all. Thank you, Justice. Uh, I wanna thank uh, all of our poets this evening, beauty and power and truth. Um, the one different thing about um, doing our readings this year this way um, is that our, our poets don't have an opportunity to see us doing this spontaneously or clapping our hands, uh, clicking, just making, um, our motions and movements and sounds of uh, joy and um, just sheer support for uh, for the for the power in their words. So I want to thank all of our poets this evening. Um, I'm deeply moved to have been part of this. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the poets for their gifts. I'd like to thank all the staff at Split This Rock um, and to the rest of the curatorial committee. Uh, for your contributions in making these readings possible. Uh, if you have the capacity, please buy the Featured Poets books. Uh, you can um, follow hashtag Split This Rock Book Fair. That's hashtag Split This Rock Book Fair for info on where to purchase them. Um, Cameron Awkward Rich has offered to send a free signed copy of one of his books, either Dispatch or Sympathetic Little Monster to the first 15 people who claim them by emailing him at cawkwardrich at umass.edu. That's cawkwardrich at umass, U-M-A-S-S dot edu. And pledging to donate at least $50 to Glitz Inc's fundraiser, which will help provide secure and stable housing to black trans people in New York City to give uh, go to, um, well, uh, check out, it's a, it's a long um, a URL, but check out Split This Rock's Twitter account uh, for the link. Um, upcoming Split This Rock opportunities, Wednesday, July uh, 1st. Uh, please join us um, for, from, from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that reading will feature the 2019 Youth Poets Laureate. Um, we also want to let you know that applications are now being accepted until July 15th for the Poetry Coalition Fellowship at Split This Rock. This short-term paid fellowship is a part-time remote position focused on curation work. Uh, so if you enjoyed this reading this evening, uh, you can be part of that uh, exciting, exhilarating work uh, to make this kind of programming possible. Information is available at this website at the website, splitthisrock.org, splitthisrock.org. I wanna thank you all for tuning in for this evening's program. We need poetry now more than ever that speaks truth, that imagines a more truthful, nurturing and life-giving reality. Bye-bye.